Hey there, it's Joe Partavilla, and welcome back to Forbes Books Radio. Today's episode is all about the mysterious cloud. What is the cloud? I have no idea. So joining me today is the president and CEO of Entirety, one of the largest managed cloud service platforms in the world. His name is Emil Saig. Hey there, Emil. How you doing? Doing great. How about you, Joe? You know, as well as anybody could be doing these days. Now, I've done a lot of stalking. I've looked you up online, and I've heard you say the definition of the cloud is a set of pooled computing resources that are powered by software and delivered over the web. You said that 10 years ago. You were on the cloud before anybody else was on the cloud, an early pioneer of cloud computing. Why did you see a future in the cloud going back, you know, 10, 15 years? Yeah, look, that's a great question. And I think that definition is still, uh, uh, still valid today. Frankly, just like things are getting more and more pooled, uh, we're seeing more and more sharing in almost every industry. The cloud was basically sharing compute and storage resources. It was inevitable that it was going to happen. The cloud actually did happen and um, is the major phenomena in IT today. Go, now, trying to remember if you can this far back, did people think you were crazy because you were such an early adopter in this? Did people like, what? I don't understand. I, I like having my files on me all the time. I don't feel like I need to be saddled to the internet. Was there pushback from people in the industry and, and out? Absolutely. There was a lot. I mean, we were really doing evangelist work back then, 2008, 2009, 2010, really a lot of evangelist work trying to convince people this is the future. And uh, this is a better platform than uh, actually having dedicated compute and storage resources in their data closets or in their data centers and so on and so forth. Speaking of 2009, 11 years ago, I saw an interview you did where you predicted that cloud computing was going to push shared hosters out of business. I guess you were right, huh? Absolutely. That industry has been transformed. Um, So whereas... You know, potentially shared hosting is still out there, but a lot of them have moved their infrastructure to the public cloud. So they've kind of morphed and started adopting public cloud, but a lot of them are operating on the public cloud platforms. So all the people that said you were nuts are now diving into the water, right? They're going deep end. Absolutely. A hundred percent. Yeah. That, uh, that, at that conference, there was a lot of people that called me a lot more than nuts and uh, called me some uh, (laughs) names that we won't. uh... (laughs) Uh, Oh, you know, you know, it was a meaner place about 11 years ago. We're much nicer nowadays, Emil, aren't we? (laughs) You you know, what is funny when you, when you think about cloud technology, you don't have to go too far back in this, but I remember how much of a pain in the ass it was to always have to carry around a portable flash drive. It was so stressful and coming from the audio world, be like, can someone have a flash drive because I need to save this here and I need to give it to somebody else. I don't know if I have enough room in this flash drive. That's all gone. I mean, I know flash drives still exist and people use them, but they're sort of dinosaurs now. You don't need them. Yep. As long as you have an internet connection, I would say, look, you know, we're in the business of, you know, disaster recovery and plan A, plan B, plan C, plan D, right? So I would still have local copies um, yeah. just in case you don't, you don't have an internet connection, which is still a, a possibility, but for 99.99% of the time, you're going to have an internet connection somehow, either through your phone or, you know, through, you know, yeah. So uh, you're absolutely right. You know, I like to say that as creative as Hollywood is, Emil, they never saw a lot of things coming, like the mobile phone. If you look at old sci-fi movies that try to predict how, you know, the flying cars and things you could do, 98% of those sci-fi movies had no concept of smartphones. I know Star Trek had, you know, their little walkie-talkies and everything like that, but they couldn't think of it. Like, if you look at movies that are supposed to take place in the 2000s that were done in the 70s, 80s, no idea. Same thing with cloud computing. No one could have thought of that. I mean, think about Star Wars, how that would have been a totally different movie if the plans for the Death Star were on the cloud. <laughs> Very true. Why do you think technology, as, as creative as people in Hollywood are, they couldn't grasp these concepts? Look, even, even people that are, were in technology fought the concept of cloud very much in 2006, 2007, 2008 onward. They fought it and fought it tooth and nail. And, you know, the concept, the concept is quite disruptive and people cannot get out of their comfort zone and what they see. You know, mm-hmm. people, this is why there's very few visionaries out there that can look a lot further than folks that are, you know, kind of stuck in their own paradigm. I truly think that sometimes also we drink, you know, the same Kool-Aid, you know, we, you know, group think, and we end up not able to break through that group think. And, uh, and technology is no different. People think, well, you know, technology, they're avant-garde, you know, they're able to have big thoughts, but 
IT technology is, is slow to move uh, because we get caught in our own paradigms, quite honestly. Mm. And I think the people that are advising Hollywood, look, they come from that technology world on those topics. And I think they could not see it. They could not see it. And they could not see a distributed cloud all <laughs> over the, the galaxy. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, awesome. Right? Yeah, and you know, so we're talking about your the the tech nerds who who did not you know grasp the clouds. But I think for lay people, their intro- introduction to cloud computing was the iCloud hack of celebrity photos a few years ago. Up until then, it was mostly a business tool. How safe now are clouds? Because you remember when that whole thing went down, the you shared photos of celebrities. You know, people were like, "Oh my God, I'm uh, the cloud stuff." You know, people can access the cloud. How safe is the cloud, Emil? Look. I'm going to say it is safe, but I'm going to qualify it. The cloud itself is very safe, just like a car. However, the practices that we put behind it, are we changing our passwords? Are we using safe passwords? Are we sharing passwords? Are we using dual factor authentication? Are we using those in a consistent way, in a safe way? Because if you're not and you allow yourself to be hacked, then of course, it's not safe. You know, you've just given the keys to a complete stranger. Mm -hmm. And what we have to be careful about is what I would say is the whole realm of social engineering, where people know um, who you are because you're well known in the industry. So they come in and they start to kind of figure out the names of your pet, so on and so forth. And they start to kind of essentially test the perimeter and try to kind of figure out your personality through your social media and cross-linking these things together. So we just have to be careful not to put a lot of personal information out there because people are starting to, hackers are starting to kind of cross-link a lot of that stuff to figure out you know, how to penetrate your social media accounts, how to hack into your bank account, so on and so forth. So whereas the cloud itself is pretty safe, but we have to make sure that we as individuals are not putting information out there that could be, potentially cross-linked, and then they develop a profile on how to infiltrate your, your accounts that are out there. So it's, it's almost like a game of Clue. If you leave little clues behind as to, what, as to what your passwords may be, whether, like you said, it's a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a mom, a dad, a, a birthday, hackers will try to penetrate that and using another analogy, sort of find the weakness in the fence. Absolutely. They're going to be testing the perimeter. It's a whole discipline that's called social engineering, where they may call your significant other, they'll get information on the phone, that they look at the social media profiles. And then, you know, they will keep trying to test all these weak points until you divulge a one piece of information that they're looking for, uh, that could be the missing link in penetrating an account that they're targeting. So we just have to be very, very careful. And don't leave any breadcrumbs out there about us personally. And, And, you know, look, you know, Social media is awesome, absolutely awesome, fantastic. But you just have to be careful not to leave breadcrumbs about things that we use in our passwords. Okay. All right, one more thing on that subject. We hear about hacking and ransomware attacks all the time, trying to disrupt businesses, expose data. What kind of steps are companies like yourself, like Entirety, doing to protect their clients? Yeah, oh, absolutely. I mean, this is, this is what we do on a day-in, day-out basis. We have implemented the latest and greatest AI technologies, machine learning, so on and so forth, so that we're watching for patterns of people that are trying to infiltrate our customers. And, you know, it's almost like predictive, where we know from the type of traffic that is coming in, whether that's nefarious, bad traffic, or good traffic. If we suspect it's nefarious, then immediately the AI, the artificial intelligence and the machine learning will kick it up to a human being. And a human being is looking at it. It's like, okay, well, this is bad, you know, because we have so much traffic coming in, you know, you know, it's impossible for a human being to be watching all of the stuff. So we have human beings that are the overlords over the AI and machine learning, at least for now, we're still as (laughs) as the overlord of the machine learning and the artificial intelligence. And, you know, we have the machine, uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence doing the hard work of sifting through all that traffic that's coming in and, you know, figuring out, it's like, okay, does this look suspicious? Yes or no? If it is suspicious, then kick it up. And then a human being looks at it and determines whether that threat needs to be, quote unquote, neutralized or, you know, segmented away from, from our customers. So, you know, it could be somebody that's doing phishing attacks where they're trying to get you to click on a link 
or it could be somebody that's trying to hack into a server, somebody's trying to steal passwords, somebody that's trying to steal credit card information, or somebody that's trying to kind of come into your computer and turn on that video when you don't want that, the, the video camera to be turned on. We have seen that because we actually, one of our clients is one of the largest, um, if not the largest TV manufacturer in the world. And you know, what comes with every TV is, is cameras now. They're just yeah. like, you know, big, huge computers. And there was tons of attempts where, you know, for people to take over these TVs and turn on these cameras to unsuspecting uh, consumers. Mm. And uh, so we have to protect that whole infrastructure from, you know, being being hacked and being uh, a potential a major uh, security threat for for uh, for consumers and our customer by by default. So, I mean, without getting too technical on what you guys do, I mean, obviously AI is a big component of it. But do you have a human element? Is there someone sitting at the at the wheel? You know, watching things constantly because I always think about these big data companies, and you know, obviously it all runs on its own. But is there someone who's just like? Yeah, it looks good. That, that, that's working fine. Is, is there some human element to cloud computing? Absolutely. We have 24-7 teams that are monitoring all that stuff, you know, continuous basis. New Year's Eve, Thanksgiving, our company is fully staffed with multiple teams. You know, one team is watching the actual physical servers, the physical computers. Mm. Then there's another layer that is looking at the health of the infrastructure you know, there's some old software that's running on this group of computers, you know, so those teams are also 24 by seven teams that are, that are monitoring. And then you get the security team that I just described where there's traffic that's coming in and the AI and machine learning kicks it up to the individual, to the human being that says, should I be shutting down this flow of traffic? Yes or no? Because Mm -hmm. AI and machine learning will shut down a lot of traffic that we know for a fact, historically, is nefarious. If okay. there's traffic that is coming in from certain countries, and I'm going to single out a few countries and I'm going to be, you know, actually unapologetic to you and telling you that a lot of nefarious traffic comes in from, from China, from North Korea, from Vietnam. Russia, I have uh, a feelings Iran, in there too. Russia, absolutely. Yeah. I was going to save the best for, for last. But, <laughs> I but beat right, you to it. Yeah. <laughs> so if there's traffic that's coming in there and trying to log into a server that usually that server has only been logged into from, you know, Alberta, Canada, boom, our AI and machine learning are going to quarantine, you know, that traffic Mm -hmm. and then kick it up to a human being and say, Hey, look, is this legit? Is their staff all of a sudden travel to Siberia (laughs) and uh, is trying to log into their, their server? If not, then boom, that traffic is shunted. We quarantine it and we don't let it get to its destination. So machine learning and AI are working in conjunction with the humans that are there 24 by seven and monitoring that. I wish you wouldn't use the word quarantine, but I guess you have no choice. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it is the term, but I think, I think we're all kind of over the quarantine thing. Speaking <laughs> of which, how has Entirety been dealing with the pandemic? Is essentially everyone working from home? Do you, do you have people in the office? How are you guys handling things in your home base in Austin, Texas, correct? Yeah, we have about 14 data centers globally, so we're a global company. Currently, everybody that was an office employee that was working in office is working from home, and honestly, we have not skipped a beat in terms of productivity. However, remember, we have data centers, so we, have, we need people. Essential. We're an essential industry, and our employees are deemed essential. Our business is deemed essential. So our 14 data centers, there's no way to do that from home. You, you have thousands of computers that are running in that data center and somebody has to go in and unplug a computer that's acting up, add new capacity. A human being has to do that. It's physical work that needs to be done. And sometimes some of these servers are very heavy and two people have to do that. So yeah. we learned what to do and what not to do because of our subsidiary that is in Korea operating in South Korea. We saw what happened there. They immediately sent all their workforce that was office employees to home and then, um, and they took the precautions, you know, they bought the gear for their employees that were working in the data center. So we did immediately that. We said, look, this thing is coming and this is a no regret decision that we're going to be making. Who cares? Like, you know, buy more PPEs than you need. Like, so, okay. so these guys in your, the, basically nerds in your, in your data centers, they're in hazmat suits? Or in PPE? I mean, not hazmat, but they're in, in, I mean, you know, gloves and, and, uh, Masks. and absolutely. Yeah, yeah. 
That's yeah. crazy. You know, but everybody else is is been working from home, and um, you know we adjusted very well. Now in certain states, the orders are lifted. We're not rushing back to the office, but you know we're starting to kind of introduce a few people here and there in those states where we're able to do it and uh, where we need to do it. Honestly, it's just a you know whether we're able to do it is not a factor. You know, we got to make sure that it's safe for our employees and uh, that it's needed at this point. You're obviously a, you know, a visionary in cloud computing. You, you kind of, you you always look a few steps ahead. I wonder as a CEO of a company, and I, and, and I always think about this kind of stuff, like you look at the campuses of Apple and Facebook and Google, they built these sprawling campuses that attract all the talent in the world. And now that we're in this sort of post-COVID world, hopefully soon. What's the point of all those campuses and the, the, the millions of dollars these companies spend on real estate if we're looking at a possibility of everybody working from home? I mean, you've already seen Facebook and Twitter do it. Are those places obsolete? Do you see like entirety just having like an a office above a garage in Austin, Texas that houses a couple of guys, but everyone else works remotely? Have you thought about the future of working from home? Absolutely. I think it's going to be a hybrid model. Look, you know, frankly, at some point, you know, we're going to need the human interaction again. I don't know that we'll go back to a full office environment even here at entirety where it's going to be a hybrid model. You know, maybe people, certain teams will come in a couple of days a week, work together just so they can get the social interaction. But I do think that, you know, that model of huge campuses, of dense populations is going to get questioned. You know, just like the retail model got rethought because e-commerce and online commerce, you know, essentially obsoleted a good portion of it, not all of it, but mm-hmm. a good portion of it. I do think that uh, working in the office is going gonna, is gonna to get rethought and it's going to be a hybrid model where there are certain days where, you know, certain teams will come to work because they want to interact and they want to collaborate and they want to brainstorm mm-hmm. and so on and so forth. But, you know, the, the traditional model of eight to five, five days a week in the, in the office is going to get rethought for a lot of companies. Yeah. And I wonder too, because, you know, obviously you're in the tech sector, but like even knowledge workers, I look at these companies that have had to lay people off and they've furloughed a lot of employees. And I think if they didn't have that office on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan with the beautiful view, they probably could have afforded having all these people if they had their office in Brooklyn or Queens in New York, for example. So I wonder if that model will change where you don't need that fancy office because everyone, like you said, at one point, maybe three or four days a week will be working from home and they'll only come to the office when they have to. Because if you think about it, Emil, you know as well as I do, real estate ain't cheap, especially if you're in Austin, New York City, the Silicon Valley. Can you imagine? How, I mean, you hate to see what would happen to the commercial real estate business, but you look at these companies, how they don't need to spend money on all this stuff, do they? Absolutely. We're the same way. We have not renewed a couple of leases because we, uh, and we've informed our landlord uh, because we don't foresee in a certain region, our team getting back to a office environment. You're absolutely right. This is going to be a major change. Do you need a conference room for team meetings? I would say, yes. Could you rent that conference room whenever you have team meetings instead of, you know, again, going back to the sharing economy, right? That's what we talked about, you know, whenever it started with cloud, could you rent, you know, is there going to be more rent a space for a few days so that you can have these big team team meetings brainstorm? Because again, you know, I do think that whenever you're in the creative space, you know, sometimes you feed on other people's uh, Mm. energy and video doesn't do it justice. You know, you're in the same room, you know, writing on a board, you know, it's just, it's just not the same. So I do think for those folks that are engaged in that creative process, I do think that, you know, they still need some element of physical space, but I do think a permanent physical space is going to get questioned going forward. Well, his name is Emil Saig. He is the CEO and president of Entirety, the largest managed cloud service platform in the world. Emil, first of all, I got to thank you for educating me because as you can tell from our conversation, I'm not very bright. So thank you for not speaking above me. I understood everything you said. So thank you very much for that, first of all. Joe, you're awesome. Thank you. This has been great. I really appreciate it. And uh, you know, it's awesome talking to you. So yeah. Well, thank you. It's, it's my honor and good luck with entirety. Good luck in Austin. Hopefully you'll be able to uh, keep it weird out there because that's the motto in Austin, right? Absolutely. We're keeping it weird. Absolutely. <laughs> Every day. All right. Take care, sir. Okay. Thank you so much. Take good care. This has been a production of Forbes Books Radio. Find out more at ForbesBooksRadio.com.